We will begin our service with word of prayer. But also, the Bible also encourages us to pray for those that feed us in the Lord. So I want you, wherever you are right now, bow down your head with me as we lift up our pastor, Reverend Moses and his team in prayer. Holy Father, we thank you for being a faithful father. God of time and season. God who started things in eternity past by planning and bringing them to pass in our time. Father, we lift up this hour your son, Reverend Moses, and his team that have gone to Africa to do your work. Precious Father, we pray for your hand upon your servant health. We pray for healing, sound health. We pray for protection. We pray for provision. We pray that as you have taken him to Africa to do your work, he left here in health, that we bring him back to us in one piece. That at the end of your work, we all gather together to thank you. So, Father, we pray for maximum protections, for provisions, for safety, for health. Father, we lift up today's service before you. We are here to hear you speak to us. We are not here because we want to see any man but to hear the voice of man. But as we will be taught the right way to live the right Christian way of life, that we will be taught on how to handle the challenges of life. Precious Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit speak through me to every prepared heart, both in this auditorium and those joining us by on. Holy Father, sanctify our hearts for the truth of your word for pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We are still on the series, Living in Light of Eternity. And today we will be treating the reason why believers suffer, part seven, but we'll focus on number eight. If you have been with me on this series, you will know why I said it's number eight, because we have treated number one through seven of the reasons why believers suffer. Today we are focusing on number eight. And that is God use our suffering to increase our testimony concerning himself. God use our suffering. God brings suffering to our life in order to use that suffering as a testimony for himself. You see, when we examine the life of Apostle Paul, before he was called into the ministry, God told Ananias that he had been chosen as a vessel and said, he's going to suffer for my sake. That will serve as our garden test. I want you to register that in your mind as we look at this part of this type of suffering. That some suffering is meant to be a testimony to God. The first place we are going to look at, Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. Philippians chapter 1. So open your Bible with me. So Philippians chapter 1. Verse 
Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14 reads. Now, I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances, which is his imprisonment, Paul wrote these episodes from prison. So he's talking to them about his prison experience. So I will repeat again. Now, I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. So that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guide and to everyone else. Verse 14. And that most of the brethren trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. You see, Paul's suffering has been the reason why some gave their lives to Christ. And also, some believers are preaching Christ. Let us also see as 16. As 16, 22 to 31. As chapter 16, verses 22 to 31 reads, And the crowd rose up together against them. And the chief magistrates tore their robes off them and proceeded to order them to be beaten with rod. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to guide them securely. And he, having received such, an, such a command, threw them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymn of praise to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly, there came a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chain were unfastened. And when the jailer had been and when the jailer had, had been roused out of sleep and had seen the prison door opened. He drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. And he came, he called for light and rushed in and trembled with fear. He fell down before Paul and Silas, and asked, and after he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? That one, the last verse. And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you shall be saved, you and your household. If you read on and on and on, you see that the man gave his life to Christ. What led to the man giving his life to Christ? Paul imprisonment, Paul attitude in prison, convinced the man that I don't have what you guys have, I need it. And they simply told him, it's Christ. So, persecution experienced by some believers have resulted in salvation of many. 
the faithfulness of these believers has served as a face, as a soul winning tool for the unbelievers. You may have heard or you have seen some people that came to Christ, some unbelievers that came to Christ said, after I have observed how this believer handled the persecution in his life, I am convinced or I was convinced that his message, that his faith in Christ is true. I need that Christ. So I asked for the gospel and I became a believer. You have also heard or witnessed certain believers that we are living in fear. Having witnessed or see other believers, how they handle their suffering. And they were motivated to go out all in for Christ. Like we just read in the book of Philippians, Paul talked about some believers that went out there because of his imprisonment to go preach the gospel. He also talked about those that gave their life to Christ because of his imprisonment. So where am I going with all this? Before you start screaming, God, remove. This suffering is too much for me to bear. I don't want this. Or you are facing family persecution because you just become a believer. And you start saying, I thought they're going to accept me. I thought they're going to treat me special. But look at it. Everybody have turned against me. Or in your workplace, the people that used to be your body body don't want you around them anymore. Why? You are a Christian. You just gave your life to Christ. And everybody turned against you. If you don't have the right tools to handle it, you will mess up everything. Either you start living a life of retaliating, withdrawal by trying to be on your own. I don't want to communicate with anybody because they don't like me. Or you start questioning God. I thought by believing in you, I would be the body body of everybody. I thought the time I gave my life to you, my daddy will start loving me, my mommy will start loving me, everybody around here will love me. But unfortunately, look at me. Everybody is turning against me. Some friends that you used to hang out with before, they are now staying, hey, bro, stay. Give me five years. Sister, stay away for a while. Because you are the light. Something has taken place. You are now a child of God. So, we should know how to handle this kind of things. For example, there is this Chinese pastor who has gone to be with the Lord by the name Samuel Lam. He told his visitor, and I quote, the more this church suffer, the more it grows. More persecution, more growth. He told them, using his own church as an example of this truth. Each time I was taken into prison, the church grew. End of quote. The man sat down and understand the pattern of what God is doing. 
Oh, my imprisonment is making the body of Christ to increase in number. When they hear, oh, some lamp is taken to the prison again, more people will believe in Christ. You know why? It's lifestyle. You know why? They have seen how he handles this type of suffering. So our goal today, with the help of the Holy Spirit, who have helped him to put this message together, is to know what to do. When we experience persecution, we have people in third world country like Nigeria, other parts of the world like China, that if you believe in Christ, you become automatic enemy of your family, your society, and the government. You have to do it secretly. And if you don't know how to handle it, you mess up things. So, my goal this morning is to help us to know what to do. And that leads us to the title, What to Do During Persecution. What to do during persecution. When you encounter persecution as suffering, what do you do? Number one, understand that God is sovereign. He is in control. Not your circumstances, not the persecutor, but God. The persecutor can only do that which is allowed by God. Let's look at First, first, second Chronicle 26. Second Chronicle chapter 20, verse 6. And it reads, And he said, O oh Lord, the God of our fathers, art thou not God in the heavens, and art thou not rulers over all the kingdom of the nations? Power and might are in thy hand, so that no one can stand against thee. The power and might is in your hand. That means the persecutor can only do that which is allowed by God. Let's see Job. Job 12, 9 and 10, verse 9 and 10. Job chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. Who among all these does not know that the hands of the Lord has done this? In whose hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind? When you are experiencing persecution and you have the understanding that the persecutor cannot do what God did not permit. You will be rest at peace knowing that God knows what I can bear in this persecution. And this persecution can only do that which God allowed. This persecutor can only do that which God allowed in my life. Two, 
that the goal of this persecution is to bring glory to God at the end of it all. What I'm going through will end in God's glory, not in my favor. It may, if God wants it to be in your favor, but the end, overall goal, God's glory. The place we just read in the introduction, Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. Paul talked about his experience. And through his experience, many believed in Christ. That's God's glory. Through his experience, many believers now stood up and said, now that Paul is in prison, I'm going to evangelize. The gospel cannot be imprisoned, even though Paul is in prison, but the gospel will not be in prison. So I'm going to evangelize. So they moved. So Paul's imprisonment ended in God's glory. You see, we are all created for God's glory. Isaiah 43, verse 7b. You and I are created, are created for God's glory. And salvation is the beginning part of being glory, giving glory to God. Because only Believers of spiritual integrity can adequately or fully glorify God. To glorify God, you must first be a believer. And then you start doing the things that will glorify God. You learn this Bible, you apply it, you pray, you evangelize others. So, why in prison, Paul's imprisonment was accomplishing all those things. Number three, believers who is experiencing persecution should not shut his mouth. Rather, he should use the opportunity to evangelize as many as possible. Let's see how Paul handled it. Acts 26, verses 19 through 23. Acts of Apostles, chapter 26. Verses 19 through 23 reads, Paul is before King Agrippa here. He was asked to defend himself. You see, the Jews want us to kill you. They want you to be dead. Paul, what have you to say about the charges they brought against you? And look at what Paul did. Let's read. Consign, consequently, King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedience to the heavenly vision, but kept declaring both to those of Damascus first and also at Jerusalem, and then throughout all the region of Judah and even to the Gentile, that they should repent and turn to God. Performing deeds appropriate to repentance. You see what Paul did? Paul used the opportunity to give King Agrippa and the hearer the gospel. Let us also see Acts 28, 
30 and 31. Acts chapter 28, verse 30 and 31. <coughs> verse 30 reads, And he stayed two full years in his own rented quarters and was welcoming all who came to him. That one, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all openness unhindered. unhindered. You see, why Paul was waiting for his trial before Caesar, he was on house arrest, rented apartment. Everyone that come, Paul, give them the gospel. Give them the gospel. He keep preaching to them, teaching them about Christ. But here we are, we have people, every little thing, we focus on ourselves. The truth is, every finger should point to Christ. Ugly situation in our life should be a means of us pointing to Christ, not to ourselves. Number four. The time of persecution is the perfect time to express the love of Christ. To your persecutors and those around you. When God opened their eyes, when God opened their eyes, one of the things they will notice is how you treated them. I have been so unfair to this fellow. I have been so unkind to this fellow, but look at how he's treating me. Look at the love he's showing me, even in the midst of all these things. And the person will say, I need that thing that you have. I want that your Jesus. Let's see what Jesus said concerning those are persecutors, how we should, should treat them. Matthew 5, 44. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 and 44 reads, But I say to you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute. Love, love, love your enemy. And how do we love our enemy? Let's see Romans 20, 20, Romans 12, 20, 28. Romans chapter 12, verse 28. Do you see them say, enemy, I love you? Or do you do something? Romans chapter 12. I see you want me dead. Should I want you dead back? Should I? You don't like me because of my new faith. What am I supposed to do to you? Hate you? No. Romans chapter 12 verse 20. But if your enemy is hungry... Feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. Expression of love to your persecutor. Are you being persecuted by family members? They want to see your love. Employer, colleague at work. They want to see your love. Who 
whatever it may be. If you are not loving, you are not yet showing them Christ. Number five. Pray for your persecutors that God will open their eyes to the truth of the gospel for them to be saved. The primary purpose is not for them to stop the persecution. The primary purpose is that they should come to Christ because by coming to Christ, they will stop the persecution. We just read that. And we can repeat it again. Matthew chapter 5. 44. Matthew chapter 5, verse 44. He said, But I said to you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. Pray for those who persecute you. That prayer is no prayer of death. God, I hope he don't wake up from sleep so that I can be free. Yes, let him just pass away. No. Or I hope they sack that lady, that my wicked boss. Let them replace her so that I can have a free ride in this company. No. Pray for her eyes to be open. What you see, he or she have not seen it. But change your life. She or she have not behold it. Only when the veil is taken off. She said, oh. Or he said, oh. I have been on the wrong path. Numbers. Six. When you are being persecuted, it's not the time to indulge in sin. So let's put it this way. The believer should not indulge in any sinful act. Persecution is not the time for you to sin. Or your persecution should not be because you are living a sinful life. It should be because of what? Christ. Let's see as 9, 15, and 16. As chapter 9, verses 15 and 16. As chapter 9, verses 15 and 16. But the Lord said to him, he's talking about Ananias going to pray for Paul, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. He didn't say for committing a crime. He didn't say for stealing. He said for my name's sake. Let us also look at as, as 16 verses 17 through 24. We read some part of it, but now we're going to get a full story. As chapter 16 from verse 17. Following after Paul and Silas, who is this person following them? The slave gear that have a demon or evil spirit. She, keeps, she kept saying, kept crying out saying, these men are born servant of the most high God who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. Even the demon know. You see, it's, they are proclaiming the way of salvation to you. 
18. And she continued doing this for many days. But Paul was greatly annoyed and turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out at, the very, at that very moment. But when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the market, marketplace before the authority. And when they had brought them there, brought them to the chief magistrate, they said, these men are turning out, uh, these men are throwing our city into confusion, being Jews, and are proclaiming custom which it is not lawful for us to accept or to observe being Romans. Now, where we are going. And the crowd rose up together against them, and the chief magistrate tore their robes off them and proceeded to order them to be beaten with rod. Why do we have to do, go through this? Paul and Silas were not arrested because they were stealing. They were not arrested for committing one crime or the other. They were arrested for preaching the gospel. The gospel led to commanding the spirit in the slave gear to depart. Instead of the owner of the slave gear, the master being happy that this guy is set free, Personal interest comes in place. Oh, our means of livelihood is gone. And that is how many of us are. Many times we put our personal interest before God. If I do this, do the other one, it's going to affect me. So I don't want that. We hinder the gospel. But the truth is, as believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, our personal interests have no place when it comes to God and his word. So, Paul and Silas went into the prison. We already read that part. And the Philippian jailer was saved. But the call was not because they were committing sin. To further buttress that, let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 27. I'm not going to read them all, but I want you to write them down and read them at your convenience. <coughs> I'm only going to read verse 23, but you can take time to read the whole verse 23 through 27. This is what Paul has to say. He said, Paul is defending his apostleship. And he said, are they servants of Christ? I speak as if in sin, I more so. In far more labors, <clears throat> in far more imprisonment, beating time without numbers, often in danger of death. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so what Paul is saying here is, are you talking about the elevens being of apostle and me, I'm not? I am also an apostle. I have labored more than them. And he gave you a resume of all that he suffered because of Christ. So, our take home from this part of the study is we should not let our suffering be because we are committing sin and we say they don't like me. You are an employee 
you are violating your employer or empl your employment procedure. You are not working your work or doing your work according to the requirement of your workplace. And they rose up to say things about you, gives you a write-up, suspension, whatever it is. And instead of you to say, I am sorry for violating this code, I will do better. It's them to you say, no, because I'm a Christian, they don't like me. And you know you are lying. You are a child in a home and you become born again. And you are not keeping to the family rules. And your parents try to discipline you. And you say, because I just turned to a uh, Christian. Uh, you see, they don't like me because I'm a believer. Deep inside you, you know it's wrong. You are lying. You are lying. Oh, you are a spouse. You are not living the way you should live. And your spouse started acting the way he or she should not act because of your changed behavior. <clears throat> Instead of you to look inwardly and say, what is it that I'm not doing right? You run into conclusion that, oh, it's because I'm a believer. We should be careful. All this thing is because of Christ. And that will take us to our next point. Believers or the believer should not give the persecutor ground to mock his or her God through his or her unprofessional quality of work or life. I will repeat it. The believer should not give the persecutor the ground to mock his or her God through his own professional quality of work or lifestyle. You are under persecution. Be it at home, be it at workplace, whatever it may be, in the society, the first thing they will try to attack is how you live your life and those things. For example, a child that become born again, all of a sudden is no more doing house chore. The first thing the parents will start looking at, you used to do this cleaning. What now happened? Is that that your new God? Hey, I don't want that God here. Why? You, you have changed. You are an employee at work. You have been known for doing excellent work, excellent job. All of a sudden, you have this file piling upon this one, the other one piling upon the other one. You have this one undone, the other one undone. And they see you, you flip Bible. What happened? And they say, we're giving you two, two weeks suspension for not having your work done. Is that how you Christian behave? No. When you become a child of God, when I become a child of God, if the world requires or expect 10% loyalty, hardworking from others, your own should be times 10. Guess what? Your God is the focal point. Not you. Your God should be, your God is focal point. Because everything will go back to your God. Oh, is that how they act? Is that how they behave? Is that how they live? Like Apostle Paul will say, before I give the Bible passages, I know a fellow many years ago, when this fellow becomes a believer, the kind of people that started visiting him, many of them don't look well kept. Many of them, their shoes 
have eaten to one side that if they are walking, they are not walking properly because of the way they dress. And this fellow will be trying to evangelize his family member. And the family member he's trying to evangelize will say, so you want me to live this way I am now? I start being like that fellow. No. Because guess what? What he's saying to him is not encouraging. Okay. Then there was a time that somebody was reported that they caught a man and a woman in somewhere. And that was a pastor. And this fellow we said, you see that pastor? You see what they just said? You want me to join this group? You see, everything this fellow is seeing is not helping the gospel. So, you and I should know that the world expects more from us than the people of the world. So if you are under persecution in the family, at work, wherever it may be, you have to top up your game. When I mean top up your game, improve or increase the level of your quality work. Let's start looking at the Bible passages. Just two. Second Corinthians 6, 3, and 4. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verses 3 and 4 reads. Second Corinthians chapter 3. Sorry, I'm drinking a lot of water today. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, he said, Give no cause for offense in anything, in order that the ministry be not discredited. Everything you and I are doing, the focus should be the gospel. Will I be able to bring this person to church after acting this way? Will I be able to tell this person about Jesus after being disrespectful? Some of the things that can hinder our message about Christ, I didn't say all, oh, I said some include laziness. Are you a lazy believer? And you want to convert an uh, employee that is hardworking, diligent in his work. You think that will work? Every day I come and see you, you're lazing around, you're not doing anything. And I'm busy working, trying to make things happen in this organization. And then you say, brother, I want to invite you to church. How's that thinking? This guy is lazy. So when I join him, I will be lazy. You see, your message will not fly. Another one may be dirty. Are you living a life of dirtiness? Each time I see you, you look so dirty. And here I am. I dress moderately. And you want to give me the gospel. I was looking. Yes, he may have a good message, but do I want to look like him? Another one is being disrespectful. You're so arrogant, so disrespectful. I just watch you disrespecting a janitor because he or she is a janitor. And now you're giving me gospel. Oh, if I become like you, I will start disrespecting people. Is that what I want? I am your colleague at school, your classmate. I came to visit you and I saw you disrespecting your mother or your father. And now you're giving me the gospel. 
And me, I had been respecting my parents all along. I said, oh, oh. If I should be like her, that means I won't be able to respect my parents. Because I don't know whether that's what they're teaching them. Another one is undisciplined lifestyle. I have been around to you. I see how undisciplined you are. And now you're giving me the gospel. Now you want me to be like you. Because you don't have a plan. Your life is without plan. Your life is without plan. You just live anyhow. You have no goal. You have no ambition. And you want me to follow you? Next, we are always argumentative and quarreling. Everything that somebody said to you, you must have a counter opinion. And you're always ready to quarrel. After, maybe I come to your work to submit an application. And I see how you quarrel with your boss, your colleague, whoever it may be. And I finish submitting an application. You say, let me not lose this soul. Let me make sure this will get the gospel. Hey, brother, excuse me. I want to tell you about Jesus Christ. I just saw you quarreling with somebody. Arguing with somebody? And if I am not a quarrel type, the next thing that goes up in my head is, I don't know what she's talking about, what he's talking about, but if I should believe, maybe I will be like him. Is that quarreling? Arguing? Let's see what Paul told Titus. Second Titus 2, verse 2 through 5. Can somebody tell me what the time is? Am I seeing correctly? Is that uh, 25 minutes after? Okay, I will try to see how far, because I want to finish this topic. So just read that at home, okay? Titus chapter 2, verses 2 through 5. Next one is very, very important. God will help me. Believers should dress modestly. Our dressing speaks volume. Like I said, this period that I know many years ago, this person that he is trying to evangelize, keep pointing at, the, dre- at the, the, the dressing, the appearance of those around him, and saying, I don't want to be like them. Not that I don't want to hear what they are, what they are saying, the way they look. Because of our time, 1 Timothy 2, 9. Our appearance speaks to everybody, fellow believers and unbelievers. And the Bible expects us to do everything to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. But I want to touch on key things, then I will rush the rest. You see, everything we do, there is a motive behind it. And if the motive is not right, it's sin. So if you dress or I dress, doesn't matter who it be, who it may be, and you're, you don't look at the following things, one thing to check is, uh, is my dressing drawing attention to me? When I put on clothes, What's going on in my mind? Is it drawing attention to me? It's one thing I check. Number two, am I addressing to feel superior to somebody? 
Number three, is my dressing creating jealousy? After I finish dressing, who will jealous my dressing? Number four, am I dressing to seduce somebody? To insert lust in somebody. If any of these things comes to your mind that this is the purpose, my brother, my sister, you need to change. Because everything is supposed to be to God's glory, not me, not you. Proverbs 31 verse 30 should be our guide. And we're going to read that before we proceed, even though I know my time is almost up. Proverbs 31. Proverbs chapter 31, verse, verse, sorry, 31, don't mind me, 31 verse 30, and it reads, Charm is deceitful, and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord shall be praised. It's not just a woman who fears the Lord, a man that also Fear the Lord. So everything you and I do, you focus on God. Whether you are a man, a man can dress seductively. A man can dress with all those things that we talked about here. Similar way a woman can do it. But check what goes on in your mind as you dress. Okay, let's move to the next point because of our time. Number nine. Let the joy of Christ be seen in you. You are under persecution. Don't whine and complain. Let it, the joy be seen in you. The Philippian jailer and those in the prison with Paul saw how Paul was joyful. Despite the situation he found himself. And he became a, he became a soul winning tool. Read that in um, Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16. Number 10. Fill your mind with the word of God. Fill your mind with what? The word of God. And if you have no access to the word of God, Try to recall the one you have stored in your mind. Because those are what will encourage you during that time. This fellow that I said I know many years ago, two or three times his Bible was taken away from him. He had nothing to fall back on. So if you find yourself in that situation, you have nothing to fall back on. The word of God in your soul is time to start remembering them. <clears throat> Because that is an awkward, challenging situation. Number 11. Remain faithful to the cause of Christ. For you will be rewarded for your faithfulness and commitment in God's due time. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 4. 58, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Number 12. If you have access to fellow believers, allow them to be God's source of encouragement to you. If you have access to, God, to fellow believers, allow them to be God's source of encouragement to you. This fellow that I said I know many years ago never have access. Never had access. You don't go to fellowship. None of those people comes here. You just go to school, come back home, and that's it. So if you have access, let them be God's source of encouragement. That means if you can go to church, go to church, be encouraged by believers at the church. If they can visit you, let them visit you and encourage you. 
you see that in Philippians 1, 7, 4, 15. The Philippian church was a source of encouragement to Paul. Lastly, pray for God's strength and grace for the length of time that the persecution will last. Pray for God's strength and grace in order to be able to go through this trial, through this suffering. It may be a short time, long time. It may be the source of you exiting this world like Paul. But the thing is, you will always have God's strength and grace with you. You see that in um, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. It's a prayer without season. Philippians 4, 6. In everything with prayer and thanksgiving, let your request be known unto God. Can we, shall we bow down our head and pray? Father, we thank you for your love, for your mercy, for your grace. I want to bring this moment by asking anyone that have heard my voice who has not made the ultimate decision of becoming a child of God. What we just discussed is for the family of God, not for unbeliever. So, to benefit from this, you just have to do what the Philippian jailer did. What must I do to be saved? And Paul says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved. And just by this simple act of faith, you believe that Jesus is the Christ and that his work on the cross took care of your sin. You are a member of the body of Christ. I want to call on Brother Perry to close us in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for this time together. Father, we can never thank you enough for your faithfulness and for your love and all that you continue to do to bless us in such time as these. We want to pray for the team in Nigeria who uh, dedicated the last few days to your word. We thank you for those that join from the north, the south, and the east, and the west and pray that they would continue to be strengthened by your word. We thank you so much for this service this morning and for all that we've learned. And Father, we just pray that we, when we gather next time on Wednesday that we would continue to be strengthened each and every day. Father, I recognize that there's about two weeks left of this year and I thank you for all that you've done these, this last year to strengthen us and guide us to the teaching of your word. Thank you so much for the fellowship of Bethlehem Missionary Church that you would continue to strengthen us as well and prepare us for the future. We love you so much and we ask these things in Christ's name, amen.